So two people with OCs that make it very clear they're both bisexual teenagers decide to use avatars that also make it very clear they're both bisexual teenagers to respond to a guy insulting Super Mario 64. It does not go particularly well. To give a slightly more in-detail explanation, this anime boy with a hoodie is named Fireball PT, this girl who I'm pretty sure is from Dankenrampa, but I in no way care enough to check is Umbris, and this cartoon character is the person they're commentating on named Toxiquid. I'll also be skipping the first, like, three minutes or so because it's just an intro skit that I did find, to be fair, mildly amusing. What's crack a lock and Toxic Crew? My name is Toxic Quid, and Super Mario 64 has recently come into my life, and I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I may be spoiled rotten with, quite frankly, better 3D platformers with gems like A Hat in Time, Mario Odyssey, and hell, even Banjo Kazooie, but my god, this game is terrible in my opinion. So you're comparing the first ever 3D Collectathon to two games released within the past five years. First off, Super Mario 64 was not the first 3D Collectathon. Well, depending on how you want to define 3D. I'll say this, if you want to count Super Mario 64 as a collectathon, you have to count games like Toe Jam and Earl from 1991, Zombies Ate My Neighbors from 1993, and Ghoul Patrol from 1994 as collectathons, all of which were at least to some extent 3D. I also feel the need to ask what comparison was made between Super Mario 64 and A Hat in Time and Mario Odyssey in the clip you showed. All Toxiquid did was acknowledge that he played these games first, and that is going to influence how he perceives Super Mario 64. It's more a disclaimer about bias than anything else. For that matter, I reject the notion that comparing an old game to a newer game is inherently unreasonable. For example, if I make a statement like Braid did a better use of time travel than Blinks the Time Sweeper did, is that statement automatically invalid because there was such a long gap between the two games being released? I would say no, because both are still time travel games, and for that matter, Blinks could have done what Braid did. Now, if the comparison is invalid because, for example, the technology wasn't there, like if Toxiquid was requesting full motion cutscenes in a game that did not have the technology to do that, then I would understand. However, if all he's doing is using a new game to illustrate something that it would have been perfectly reasonable to expect an older game to do, then it is not invalid to inherently compare new and old products. I get comparing it to Banjo, since it at least came out in the same console generation, and only came out two years after Mario 64, but the former two would naturally be unfair to compare it to, since one takes the ideas Mario 64 has and refine them, and the other was a later game in the exact same series, is released 21 years later. Well, wait a minute, your description of a hat in time that it builds on concepts from Super Mario 64 is also true of Banjo-Kazooie. In fact, Rare specifically scrapped Project Dream and made Banjo-Kazooie because of Super Mario 64. For that matter, why is it building on concepts from Mario 64, meaning that a hat in time would be a bad thing to compare Mario 64 to? Would it be unfair for me to compare Mega Man 1 to Mega Man 2 because Mega Man 2 built on concepts from Mega Man 1? Would it be unfair for me to compare Zelda 1 to Zelda A Link to the Past or Paper Mario to Paper Mario A Thousand Year Door or Sonic Adventure to Sonic Adventure 2 for the same reason? If anything, the fact that A Hat in Time builds on concepts from Super Mario 64 would make it a good source for comparisons, because then we know the two games have a series of similarities. We can therefore look at what A Hat in Time did right and Mario 64 did wrong and vice versa to try and construct a better idea of what a good 3D platformer collectathon would look like. I get going back to Mario 64 can be awkward if you've ever experienced better platformers. Heck, I feel the same. But if you're gonna compare Mario 64 to anything, at least make sure the games were released in the same era. Also, this might just be me being a nitpicky asshole. Get that the fuck away from me. But I can't be the only one who finds it redundant that he repeats the fact that it's his opinion. No, he doesn't. Out of the one clip you've played of Toxiquid so far in this video, he briefly mentions it's his opinion, 
at the very end of it. That's not repeating it, nor is it redundant. Like, I think we can clearly tell that from not only the first time you said that, but the title as well. Like, I'm sure your average Joe will be able to figure out that this is an opinion piece. This just seems pretentious. So him saying it's his opinion and therefore implying it's perfectly okay if others have opposing views is pretentious? What kind of sense does that make? Even if you think what he was saying was condescending, in which case you could have just said that, by the way, what about it was egotistical or arrogant? You know, synonyms for pretentious because pretension is the idea that you were better than everybody else. I'm the government, I'm the government, I'm the reason nothing works. For this section, let's talk about the actual way Mario reacts to your abnormally sized thumb when it manipulates the left stick. I'm not gonna beat around the bush. Mario is slippery while moving, like abnormally slippery when compared to his more recent outings. This is a huge problem because it makes doing precise platforming, which is required in some areas, nearly impossible. Ah yes, let's say that a game from 1996 controls worse than a game from 2017. I'm not good at the mathematics, but I think that a 21 years difference is bigger than the Mariana Trench. Out of curiosity, are you light years away from facing Brock? Also... This I kind of get because there was actually a comparison here, but I still feel like you missed the point. He specifically said that the issue was not that Mario was slipperier here than he was in other games, but that the game requires you to do precise platforming that the controls are too slippery to comfortably do. For that matter, why is Super Mario 64's age a reason for the controls to be bad? Especially considering there are plenty of Nintendo 64 games that most people would agree have aged just fine control-wise. Off the top of my head, Mario Kart 64, Banjo-Kazooie, Star Fox 64, Donkey Kong 64, Banjo-Tooie. Again, these are just all improv off the top of my head. Now, if he was talking about something like graphics or audio quality, again, then I would understand. But, controls don't get better as time goes on. There are tons of games from all eras of gaming that control perfectly fine. Mario 64, in his mind, is not one of them. I cannot tell you how many times I died on that first Bowser level because of how stupidly small the platform is to get that first red coin, but we're gonna get to that later. What the game is telling me with these super slippery Mario controls is that when he starts moving, he wants you to keep moving. What is this, a Sonic game? No wonder we couldn't find Luigi for 21 years. We assumed we were playing as Mario, but clearly we are playing as fucking Luigi because of how slippery he is. All right, that's enough. <clears throat> that's why we have so many momentum-based attacks, like the dive and long jump, as well as the flip jump with the sub ascend momentum, as well as stuff like the wall jump, which I consider momentum-based, seeing as in my two runs of the game, I can only get it to work with a running start or doing something like a flip jump. Otherwise, I just jump into the wall like a Nimrod, and I don't want to look like a Nimrod in a Mario game, or any game for that matter. In my mind, I consider that just bad game design. While I agree with you that the wall jump in this game isn't as good as it is from Sunshine onwards, I Which he never said, in fact, this kind of comparison is the exact thing you've been berating Toxiquid for doing throughout this entire commentary. I wouldn't call it bad design. Since momentum-based gameplay, while it can be a bit tricky to get the hang of it first, can be really fun once you get the hang of it. And his entire point is that it is unreasonably tricky to get the hang of the momentum-based controls in Mario 64. What's your point exactly? He didn't say say that this type of gameplay style was doomed to fail always, he just said Mario 64 is not a good example of it. The fact of the matter is that Mario clearly was designed for more open area exploration stuff, and that just doesn't mesh well with around a third of the levels, and even more sections and even more levels make this shit unbearable. Legit, I think the only people this benefits are the speedrunners, but considering that I'm experiencing this for the first time in the 3D All-Stars pack, I can't even do all the fancy movements in the first place, so it doesn't really apply to me. Okay, first things first. While yes, for a few levels, I agree they don't mesh the best with the controls, that's more of a level design issue and not really one with the controls. I guess, but the point of controls in video games is to allow the player to smoothly and easily go through the levels. If the controls do not complement the levels, that is just as much the fault of the controls as it is the level design. Again, you're just drawing arbitrary lines for no real reason. You can't always neatly categorize problems in video games as this specific problem. 
Sometimes things are more complicated than that, and this is a very good example of that. Yes, if the controls do not complement the level design, the controls are bad. The level design is also bad. Multiple things can be bad at once, Firebolt. I don't know what else to tell ya. Just because some levels weren't built with the controls in mind, doesn't mean the controls are bad. For example, Mega Man X6 is awful, one of the worst 2D platformers I've ever played. But most of the problems aren't caused by the controls, but the level design, and how a lot of the levels simply weren't made for certain characters, namely Unarmored X and the Shadow Armor. Okay, now I'm just confused. So, because one game had many issues with level design, but no issue with controls, that means the two concepts are entirely unrelated, I guess? That's not how anything works. Do you know what a Venn diagram is? I think it would be very useful for you right now. That aside, I can cleanly separate the levels into three distinct styles. There are the gauntlets, which really don't have any big open areas and just focus on individual challenges, like Lethal Lava Land and Rainbow Ride, the water levels, which has a whopping three in this category, being Dar Dar Docks, Jolly Roger Bay, and Wet Dry World, and what I'm calling the box gardens, which are just giant open areas to go around in, like Cool Cool Mountain, Bob Bob Battlefield, and Tiny Huge Island. Can you tell the ones I'm gonna absolutely shit on? If you guess the box gardens, you'd be incorrect because the gauntlet levels can go jump off a tall, tall mountain because they all suck so much. These levels, especially TikTok Clock, suck so hard. It, being one of the final levels in the game, said that, yeah, they can handle bullshit, but the developers were debating back and forth and questioning how much bullshit to put in, and when Miyamoto himself came and said, yes, fuck it, put it all in. So in one world, we got conveyor belts, pendulums, rotating platforms, rotating blocks, tiny walking spaces, cages, jutting out platforms, asymmetrical rotating platforms, a womp, a large gap, vertical levels, schemes, fucking Walter. I named this guy Walter because he was always out to get me when I tried to go up the pole. I mean, it's almost like it's, by your own admission, one of the final levels in the game, and you fail to really explain why it's poorly designed outside of the set pieces the level uses. His point was that the level was throwing too much at him. Hence his characterization of it as a gauntlet or a severe trial, and then going on to list the various trials of the level that gave him trouble. Like, how do these set pieces affect the overall quality of the level? After all, you do consider it a gauntlet stage, so judge it by my understanding of your definition of a gauntlet stage, TikTok Clock tests the player's knowledge on the game, especially considering the level gets more and more difficult as Mario gets higher. Again, keep in mind that you mentioned that TikTok Clock was one of the last levels in the game, so it makes sense as to why it's one of the more challenging levels. True, but his issue is with the fact that there are so many levels in Mario 64 that could be considered gauntlet stages, not with TikTok Clock specifically. He feels the controls of Mario 64 do not properly complement the gauntlet style TikTok Clock and several others have. He is using it as an example because it is the hardest, and it is the hardest, you are correct to point out because it's one of the last, but that doesn't change the fact that it is the hardest level in a genre of stages that he does not find to be enjoyable. And that's all I have to say. Wow, I'm actually really surprised. Uh, so final thoughts? This wasn't terrible by any stretch of the imagination, but there were several parts where you missed Toxiquid's points. That's it. Good night and good luck.